G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for yet another trade update. It feels like the trade stuff is starting earlier than ever this year. Obviously, trade radio is fired up for the first time that I can remember that they've started before the grand final. Uh, and I think that's just kind of a reflection of how much player movement we're anticipating this year. It does loom to be a very, very large trade period in terms of all these moves that are being talked about. Uh, I remember last year, I think we were all maybe a little bit underwhelmed with the lack of movement. And um, as someone who likes trades and stuff like that, uh, maybe maybe I felt it was a bit underwhelming, but this year, with everything flying around at the moment, it seems like it is going to be a large one. Hence why I'm starting this kind of content a little bit earlier than usual. Of course, we do have two prelim finals this weekend. So if you want to see our previews for those finals and uh, you know general AFL talk, and of course, some more trade rumors and such, uh, we have done a podcast earlier this week in which we talk about um, the actual final series that's going on. But for now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a bit of a trade update because um, things are changing daily already. Just on the prelim finals quickly, I do intend to do at least one, hopefully both uh, live streams this weekend, getting back onto the live stream game. Uh, it's a little bit iffy with work at the moment, but I'm hoping to be there for both games. So keep an eye out for that if you want to watch the game with me. Before we get into the content, guys, do remember that we are sponsored by Manscaped.com. If you want 20% off and free shipping on some great male grooming products, they've got a, a nice range of new products for you as well. And it uh, goes beyond just the, the body shaving stuff. There's uh, heaps of other sort of consumables for you to look at as well. I mean, there's boxes to wear, there's ball deodorants, there's normal deodorant that they range now as well as uh, some ball toner and ball wipes. they got everything for you. So at least do yourself a favor and go check out the website. And if you do grab anything, make sure you use the code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word, at checkout, and you will get 20% off and free shipping on your delivery. All right, now let's get into the actual trade rumor talk. Uh, I'm going to start off with the Josh Dunkley talk. I obviously, I touched on this in my last video about whether or not he was going to decide Brisbane or Port Adelaide, and a new rumor coming out today. It's reported that he's more likely to join Brisbane than he is Port Adelaide at the trade period. I think he's uh, out of contract after seven years, so not a free agent. A trade does have to be facilitated, and I I think I said it in my last video, but it's hard to imagine how Brisbane have the draft capital to achieve everything they want in this offseason. I'm sure it gets done, but I'm just saying at this point in time, looking at it, it's hard to actually see how they're going to maneuver everything they've got going on and end up with Josh Dunkley, as well as uh, the Will Ashcroft likely number one draft pick as a father-son this year, and then uh, Jasper Fletcher as well, who's tipped to go you know, top 20, I think even top 15 to me had uh, in his personal rankings as well. So to get in, you know, what some would say is an A-grade midfield into their team uh, at, and also get in enough draft capital to match number one pick in the draft and then you know a late first early second pick as well there's a lot going on here for Brisbane and it's difficult to unpack so at this current point in time uh, and this could change because they're still actually in the finals race of course but Brisbane holds pick 15 33 44 69 and 87 so just the standard five picks with their first rounder being quite late this is subject to be supplemented with uh, Dan McStay they likely to leave to Collingwood, they think. So uh, an end of first round compensation, I think, is likely what they'd get. So they get two late first rounders in theory, and uh, it's interesting to see how they're going to juggle getting Dunkley onto their list without giving up too much of their draft position. They may need to trade future picks, whether it be to the Bulldogs for Dunkley or into this first round. I'm not too sure. You'd think to satisfy the Western Bulldogs for a trade of Dunkley's caliber, you'd think pick 15 as a starting point is there. That's not going to be enough on its own but you think it has to be involved in this deal as a starting point and then you know potentially a future first round pick so with Brisbane's trajectory obviously they're a good team in premiership contention that's probably pick 15 and maybe pick 15 next year or something similar to that. So I'm not across all the points and to be honest, I can't be bothered working out exactly the math on how they'd get this done. But let's say they offer two late first round picks. Is that enough for Dunkley? Well, I don't know. I guess he is out of contract, but I think that's probably a little bit shy of true value for Dunkley. I think he's worth, you know, a top 10 pick if they somehow need to manage to get one of those. I'm not sure how, but I do think two picks in the top 15 is probably a little bit shy of the mark for a player of Josh Dunkley's caliber. And even if they do do that, and let's say they have pick 20 as a result of McStay leaving, 20, 33, and 44, like they're going to need to get more picks in to manage to match bids for the father-sons that I referred to earlier. And I'm sure there's Brisbane fans watching this who know exactly how it's going to go down. One other alternative is that uh, Darcy Gardner is still unsigned by the Brisbane Lions. He's tipped to uh, to be re-signing with them on a 
four year deal, but apparently, you know, leaving at the last minute, I believe he did this the last time he uh, was out of contract, so it may mean nothing. But the Bulldogs are certainly on the market for a key position defender, and there is a chance this guy forms a key part of a potential trade here in which Gardner goes to the Western Bulldogs for Dunkley and Brisbane give up something else, probably at least another first rounder. Another way they could possibly do it is uh, there's a young guy called Devin Robertson on their list who is a young West Australian midfielder who's got one year to go on his contract. But if I'm him and I'm looking at Brisbane who already have a strong midfield, Robertson's already struggled to get into the side. I know he's playing in the final side right now, but on the whole, he is far from an entrenched best 22 player. And if they recruit Josh Dunkley and then Will Ashcroft as well, you could understand why Devin Robertson would be interested in exploring his options at another club. So whether he makes way as well uh, or a gardener, Brisbane have these options to get some draft capital back in. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out, but if I'm Devin Robertson looking at this situation, I'd be looking at other clubs, not necessarily Western Australia, but somewhere he could actually get some game time. Another story that broke yesterday uh, that caught me a little bit by surprise, but that's probably just because I haven't been so close to the action this year. But Ollie Henry uh, has requested a trade, and I think he's nominated Geelong as his preference, although there are some conflicting reports that are not necessarily Geelong, but he wants out because he's been lowballed in terms of a contract offer by Collingwood. He wants A, some game time, and B, probably, you know, a, a few more dollars. Uh, then he's being offered by Collingwood, which I think is a bit of a blow. I mean, you look at Ollie Henry's stats and they're not the most flattering. I think I think his performances at AFL level have impressed me at times. I think everyone has seen the potential of an Ollie Henry as a, as a bit of a match winner when he is playing well. But Collingwood do have a bit on their plate in terms of, you know, bringing McStay in. They were loosely linked to Tom Mitchell as well. I'm not sure how that gets done. Bobby Hill is also on their radar as well. So maybe Ollie Henry is sort of the cost, I guess, of, uh, of trying to get other players into the club. So he's been linked to where his brother plays in Geelong as well as Tanner Bruin. So even from a Geelong perspective, Perspective. It's interesting to see how they could get young guys like Ollie Henry and Tanner Brun onto their list. Both of them are former first round draft picks. Geelong's current picks are 18 and 36. That's if they win the premiership and that could, you know, slide a little bit further with, you know, free agency and, and how these things tend to roll. But pick 36 does seem a little bit light for Ollie Henry. I feel like to get both of these players into their club, Geelong will somehow have to part with at least one first rounder. I'm not sure how they do it. They have to be creative because we're dealing with two different clubs here. But they're also a little bit constricted because I don't believe that they can trade both first rounders uh, considering they traded first rounders for Jeremy Cameron not too long ago and there's rules around how many first rounders you can trade over a four year period. So from a Geelong perspective, obviously they're criticized for overlooking youth uh, time and time again and so far it's proving you know pretty successful for them considering where they are on the ladder. But to get two pretty promising young former first rounders onto their list this offseason would be a huge plus for a list that is going to be in transition soon if they're not already. Another interesting rumor I read today was that Brad Hill has been linked with a move to rejoin Clarkson at North Melbourne. Much has been said about their close relationship when he was at Hawthorne and seems a bit on the outer at St Kilda and you know he's taking up $900,000 a year or something like that. And North are overtly trying to get some established talent onto their list. He's still got two years to run on a deal, but perhaps with where St Kilda's at, they may think that the uh, the cost of $900,000 a year is not ideal for where they sit currently. There's also a little bit of a Hunter Clark to North Melbourne rumor as well. So maybe the Saints package Hill and Clark for some sort of deal to get to North Melbourne. Either way, I've been talking about this on the channel. It is interesting to me how proactive North Melbourne and Clarkson have been about trying to get some established talent onto their list. So Hill and Clark would add a lot of experience and I think Clark has a bit of potential at AFL level. Again, they've been linked to Logue and Tucker as well. So I'm intrigued to see how many of these players North Melbourne land and what impact it will have on their list. And personally, I like the move as well. I think they've drafted obviously really heavily over the last few years, taking you know high first round draft picks. Will Phillips was a pick three. Obviously, Horn Francis was pick one last year. LDU was pick four. Taron Thomas was around the top 10 mark from memory as well. So they've got a lot of young players that are about to hit their prime. So they're just trying to supplement that with experience. And uh, I like it. I dig it. Lou Jackson's obviously one of the biggest trade stories this year. So uh, we will touch on that briefly as well. A bit of an update since the last time I uploaded on this topic is that Luke Jackson has officially requested a trade, but interestingly hasn't nominated a club. He said he is open to playing for both West Australia clubs and this is a little unprecedented or at least in a West Australian context usually we see players request a trade home and they nominate a club which uh, has caused some criticism in the past you know Tim Kelly was probably the biggest example of that desperate to get home for family reasons but not willing to play for Fremantle so I think Jackson actually deserves a little bit of credit here he's uh, considering Melbourne's needs in mind as well and uh, this gives them some leeway into trying to
negotiate the best deal for their club. And uh, I'd imagine the contract offers are similar between the two clubs as well. I think he was an Eagles fan, not that that really matters too much. From a career perspective, it makes sense that he would probably prefer Fremantle. And I'm intrigued to see how hard West Coast actually go at this deal. I think Rowan O'Brien, our list manager, came out and suggested that pick two is not on the table, uh, which surprises a lot of people, to be honest. And it makes me question how serious we are about this trade. I don't know if we are constricted by the rule where we can't trade our first rounder. There was a bit of a suggestion recently that you can apply for an exemption to trade your first rounders if the player is young enough. So Luke Jackson probably ticks that box, but I'm intrigued to see how we would get this done. To me, I don't think we're too serious about it. I think we're trying to you know, put the pressure on Fremantle because that's, that's what the WA clubs do to each other each trade period. For me, for West Coast, I would probably trade pick two outright if uh, if that was an option to us under the rules much more than that i think it's probably bordering on too risky for a club entering a rebuild to offer too much draft capital for one player as good as jackson is and absolutely you would take him at pick two if he was in the open draft this year but if we're giving up you know two and you know a future first that would be ridiculous so i'm quietly hoping he goes to Fremantle, and i'm quietly hoping it forces out some players uh that will ultimately dismantle their club <laughs> I'm half joking when I say that, but it is an interesting little situation here developing at Fremantle where uh, players may be on the way out to accommodate Jackson. We talked about Blake Akers previously on this channel as well, uh, who has apparently already cleared his things out of Fremantle. But one development that did happen recently was that Rory Lobb has formally requested a trade to the Western Bulldogs, I believe, and in response, Peter Bell has said that uh, they're not going to trade him if they also lose, lose Griffin Logue because Lobb is contracted and they technically have that right. Now, is he just playing hardball? Maybe. He is a bit of a hard ass at the trade table. I do respect Peter Bell for that. I think he's a pretty good operator. And uh, he's coming in off seasons where Fremantle have been in a bit of turmoil with players wanting to leave. And I think he's done a fairly good job of extract extracting some value. Obviously, you know, Jesse Hogan didn't turn out. But at the time, that was a pretty good way of negotiating a locking Neal leaving the club. So the Dogs hold pick 11, uh, which is probably a pretty good value deal for a contracted lob, in my opinion. I know he's had a good year this year, but I think that's about right for a player of his caliber. He's still not the most consistent player. So on value, that makes sense, but they obviously don't want to lose Griffin Logue to North Melbourne and then also lose Lobb uh, just to get Luke Jackson in. There's also the question of how Fremantle managed to satisfy this deal. So I think they hold peak 13 currently in the draft. If they get 11 in, 11 and 13, is that enough for Jackson? Maybe. It kind of only really matters that they beat West Coast's offer. Liam Henry's another player that has been linked to a move. I think Carlton was the team that was specified on the trade rumor. So do they package Henry and Akers up and get something in return? Carlton hold pick 10, that's probably too much. Uh, pick 28 is probably a little bit too light as well. So either way, there's certainly options for Fremantle to get in some draft capital to make this Luke Jackson deal happen. But I'm interested to see how many players they lose for a start and also how they manage to maneuver their way into getting potentially a top 10 pick. And I think that's probably going to be at the starting point. A top 10 pick and maybe a late first for Luke Jackson is probably the going rate for a player they're offering for you know, a seven year contract or something like that. But just getting back to the lob deal specifically, I think the Bulldogs are going to be a pretty interesting team to watch this trade period. You know, they're obviously identified their bookends as a weakness. Lob offers them support in the ruck, obviously, uh, but he's primarily a key forward for them. So another avenue to goal. And then down back, they've been crying out for a key back. So to add Gardner and Lob, it may cost them Dunkley, but they may still stay in the first round of this draft and uh, fill a couple of important holes in their side. Before we wrap up the video, I'll touch on a few smatterings of, uh, of little rumors uh, that have also been, you know, on the airwaves recently. Georgie Artis to West Coast. Uh, has been talked about a little bit. I think there was a rumor that he'd been seen having coffee with Simo and Shui. Um, so I think the Eagles are uh, well and truly asking the question. And Port Adelaide, I think, um, according to an article that didn't really quote anyone, it suggested that Port Adelaide are, you know, anticipating West Coast asking for Georgiatis. Rowan O'Brien, after that, came out and said Georgiatis is happy at Port. He's contracted. And I know that publicly we have also said that we're not uh, about going after contracted players. So I don't know how much of that is a front, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Eagles really asking the question for 12 months' time when Georgiatis comes out of contract. So obviously, if a deal were to hypothetically happen this trade period and I don't think it will you'd think it'd be wrapped up in some sort of Rioli deal and West Coast would need to give more than just Junior Rioli to secure Mitch Georgiatis but I won't completely dash my hopes yet I really like Georgiatis it would be great to get him on the list um, but if not now 12 months time is also good by me
Ben Long has also formally requested a trade to the Gold Coast Suns on a four-year deal, which is a, a pretty big offer, for, especially from a side that um, appeared to be a little cash-strapped. Maybe Rankin leaving uh, opens up some options for them. But they've also got a few players on the list that are contracted that they potentially want to move on. I think Braden Fiorini Fier is linked to potentially a move to Collingwood. And it might be one of those deals where Gold Coast is kind of happy to get the, the contract space and, and the, the money off their list that they may get a pretty sweet deal for Collingwood. Jeremy Sharp's been linked to a trade home to Western Australia. Uh, the article suggested more likely Fremantle than West Coast, uh, which I found kind of interesting. I thought we'd at least be in the running, but Gold Coast once again are going to be active this trade period. So ranking out, Ben Long in on a four-year deal, uh, which is yeah a pretty pretty flattering contract in my opinion. Uh, and then of course they may lose some players like Fiorini and Sharp, who I don't think they'll lose too much sleep over. And finally, the other news that uh, came out recently was Tom Phillips, who's been delisted by Hawthorne. Uh, obviously sort of squeezed out of their list as an outside runner when they've just recruited Carl Amon. He's been loosely linked to Essendon, who are apparently are going for some outside run, and maybe the Saints look at him uh, if they lose Brad Hill as well. But that kind of wraps up the trade news as far as I'm aware. Obviously, if I've missed something, I may have done it in an earlier video, or I simply can't keep up with it all. But let me know in the comments what you think about uh, these potential trade moves. Where do you think Josh Dunkley ends up? Is Mitch Georgiadis going to end up at West Coast? Which club is Luke Jackson going to end up at? I'm intrigued to know your thoughts, so let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video.